Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Pride and Prejudice, and welcome back to Beer Time Stories. So, we are now on Chapter 7. In our previous chapter, we had the brief interaction between Miss Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy, where, um, by the modern parlance, she burned him excellently. And so, now, we continue on. So, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 7. Mr. Bennett's property consider, consisted, pardon me, consisted almost entirely in an estate of 2,000 a year, which, unfortunately for his daughters, was entailed in default of heirs male. Ouch, man. <sighs> Forget the whole primogeniture thing. <laughs> so yes, anyway. Was entitled in default of heirs male. On a distant relation and their mother's fortune, though ample for her situation in life, could but ill supply the deficiency of this. Her father had been an attorney in Merrington, and had left her four thousand pounds. So again, if we think about that by purchasing power, I'm gonna assume around ten mil. So basically a mil per thousand pounds. So she like she she got like four million, but I suppose added a state back in the day that would be burned through rather quickly. We'll figure it out. She had a sister married to Mr. Phillips who had been a clerk to their father, and succeeded him in the business, and a brother settled in London in a respectable line of trade. The village of Longburn was only one mile from Merrington, a most convenient distance for the young ladies, who were usually tempted thither three or four times a week to pay their duty to their aunt and to a milliner's shop just along the way. I'm now going to have to look up what a milliner is. The two youngest of the family, Catherine and Lydia, were particularly frequent in these attentions. Their minds were more vacant than their sisters, and when nothing was better offered, a walk to Merrington was necessary to amuse their morning hours and furnish conversation for the evening. And however bare of news the country in general might be, they always contrived to learn some from their aunt. At present, indeed, they were all well supplied with news and happiness by the recent arrival of a militia, reg a militia regiment in the neighborhood, and it was to remain the whole winter, and Merrington was the headquarters. Interesting. Their visits to Miss Mrs. Phillips were now productive of the most interesting intelligence. Every day added something to their knowledge of the officers' names and connections. Their lodgings were not long a secret, and at length they began to know the officers themselves. Mr. Phillips visited them all, and this opened to his nieces a source of felicity unknown before. They could talk of nothing but officers. <laughs> Men in uniform, though. Always have anyone in uniform. It's a, it's a classic trope. And Mr. Bingley's large fortune, the mention of which gave animation to their mother, was worthless in their eyes when opposed to the regimentals of an ensign. After listening one morning to their effusions on the subject, Mr. Bennett coolly observed, From all that I can collect by our manner of talking, you must be two of the silliest girls in the country. I have suspected it some time, but I am now convinced. Jeez, Dad. <sighs> Burn the kids. Catherine was disconcerted and made no answer, but Lydia, with perfect indifference, continued to express her admiration of Captain Carter and her hope of seeing him in the course of the day, as he was going the next morning to London. I am astonished, my dear, said Mrs. Bennet, that you should be so ready to think your own children silly. If I wish to think slightly, slightingly of anyone's children, it should not be of my own, however. If my children are silly, I must hope to always be sensible of it. Yes, but as it happens, they are all of them very clever. That is the only point, I flatter myself, on which we do not agree. I had hoped that our sentiments coincided in every particular, but I must so far differ from you as to think our two youngest daughters uncommonly foolish. My dear Mr. Bennet, you must not expect such girls to have the sense of their father and mother. When they get to our age, I dare say they will not think about officers any more than we do. I remember the time when I liked a red coat myself. And indeed, so I do still in my heart. And if a smart young colonel with five or six thousand a year should want one of my girls, I shall say nay to him, or I shall not say nay to him. And I thought Colonel Forrester looked very becoming the other night at Sir William's and his regimentals. Mamma, cried Lydia, my aunt says that Colonel Forrester and Captain Carter do, do not go so often to Miss Watson's as they did when they first came. She sees them now very often standing in Clark's library. Mrs. Bennet was prevented in replying by the entrance of the footman with a note from Miss Bennet. It came from Netherfield, and the servant waited for her on an answer. Mrs. Bennet's eyes sparkled with pleasure, and she was eagerly calling out while her daughters read, Well, Jane, who's it from? What is it about? What does he say? Well, Jane, make haste and tell us, my love. 
It is from Miss Bingley, said Jane, and then rang aloud. My dear friend, if you are not so compassionate as to dine today with Louisa and me, we shall be in danger of hating each other for the rest of our lives, for a whole day's tete-a-tete -tete between two women can never end without a quarrel. Come as soon as you can on the receipt of this. My brother and the gentleman are to dine with the officers. Yours ever, Caroline Bingley. With the officers, cried Lydia. I wonder my aunt didn't tell us any of that. Dining out, said Miss Bennet. That is very unlucky. Can I have the carriage, said Jane. No, my dear, you had better go on horseback, as it seems likely to rain, and then you must stay all night. That would be a good scheme, said Elizabeth, and if you were sure that they would not offer to send her home. Oh, but the gentlemen will have Mr. Bingley's chase to go to Merrington, and the hearse will have no horses on to theirs. I had much rather go in the coach. But, my dear, your father cannot spare the horses, I am sure. They are wanted in the farm, Mr. Bennet, are not they? They are wanted in the farm much oftener than I can get them. But if you have to get them today, said Elizabeth, my mother's purpose will be answered. She did at last extort from her father an acknowledgment that the horses were engaged. Jane was therefore obliged to go on horseback, and her mother attended her to the door with many cheerful prognostics of a bad day. Her hopes were answered. Jane had not been gone long before it rained hard. Her sisters were uneasy for her, but her mother was delighted. The rain continued the whole evening, without intermission, and Jane certainly did not come back. This was a lucky idea of mine indeed, said Mrs. Bennet more than once, as if the credit of making it rain were all her own. Till the next morning, however, she was not aware at all of the felicity of her contrivance. Breakfast was scarcely over when a servant from, the Nether from Netherfield brought the following note for Elizabeth. My dearest Lizzie, I find myself very unwell this morning, which I suppose is to be imputed by my getting wet yesterday. My kind friends will not hear of my returning home until I am better. They also insist on my seeing Mr. Jones. Therefore, do not be alarmed if you should hear of his having been to me, and excepting a sore throat and a headache, there is not much the matter with me. Yours, etc. Well, my dear, said Mrs. Bennet, when Elizabeth had read the note aloud, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, if she should die, it would be a comfort... Oh, I'm sorry, this is Mr. Bennet talking. <laughs> well, my dear, said Mr. Bennet, when Elizabeth had read the note aloud, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, if, he should die, if she should die, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley, and under your orders. Oh, I am not at all afraid of her dying. People do not die of trifling little colds. She will be taken well, well, take, she will be well taken care of. As long as she stays there, it is all very well. I would go and see her, if I could have the carriage. Elizabeth, really feeling anxious, was determined to go to her, though the carriage was not to be had, and she was no horsewoman. Walking was her only alternative. She declared her resolution. How could you be so silly, cried her mother, as to think of such a thing in all this dirt? You will not be fit to be seen when you get there. <sighs> I shall be very fit to see Jane, which is all I want. Is this a hint to me, Lizzie, to send for the horses? No, indeed I do not wish to avoid the walk. The distance is nothing. When one has a motive, only three miles. I shall be back by dinner. I admire the activity of your benevolence, observed Mary, but every impulse of feeling that should be guided by reason, and in my opinion, exertion should always be in proportion to what is required. It is fascinating to me that it is only like three miles distance between their house, or maybe only a mile and a half, and then total three miles, and they're talking about it like it's a marathon. <laughs> We will go as far as Merrington with you, said Catherine and Lydia. Elizabeth accepted their company, and the three young ladies set off together. If we make haste, said Lydia as they walked along, perhaps we may see something of Captain Carter before he goes. In Merrington they parted. The two youngest repaired, retired, I'm sorry, no, it does, it does say repaired. Repaired, interesting. Sometimes the language of the past is, is fascinating when you're, because we would probably say retired and think that was old fashioned, and yet repaired is what it is here repaired to the lodgings of one of the officer's wives, and Elizabeth continued her walk alone, crossing field after field at a quick pace, jumping over stales, and springing over puddles with impatient activity, and finding herself at last within view of the house, with weary ankles, dirty stockings, and a face glowing with the warmth of exercise. She was shown into the breakfast parlor, where all but Jane were assembled, and where her appearance created a great deal of surprise. That she should have walked three miles so early in the day in such dirty weather, and by herself, was almost incredible to Mr. Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and Elizabeth was convinced that they held her in contempt for it. She was received, however, very politely by them, and in their brother's manners there was something better than politeness. There was good humor and kindness. Mr. Darcy said very little, and Mr. Hurst nothing at all. The former was divided between admiration of the brilliancy which with exercise had given her complexion, 
<laughs> oh, the modern equivalent of Mr. Darcy being into gym girls. And doubt to the occasion justifying her coming so far alone. The latter, of course, i.e. Mr. Hurst, was thinking only of his breakfast. Her inquiries after her sister were not very favorably answered. Miss Bennet had slept ill, and though up, was very feverish and not well enough to leave her room. Elizabeth was glad to be taken to her immediately, and Jane, who had only been withheld by fear of giving alarm or inconvenience from expressing in her note how much she longed for such a visit, was delighted at her entrance. She was not equal, however, to much conversation, and when Miss Bingley left them together, could attempt little besides expressions of gratitude for the extraordinary kindness she was treated with. Elizabeth silently attended her. When breakfast was over, they were joined by the sisters, and Elizabeth began to like them herself, when she saw how much affection and solicitude they showed for Jane. The apothecary came, and having examined his patient, as might be supposed, that she had caught a violent cold, and they must endeavor to get better of it, advised her to return to bed, and promised her some droughts. The advice was followed readily, for the feverish symptoms increased, and her head ached acutely. Elizabeth did not quit her room for a moment, nor were the other ladies often absent. The gentlemen being out, they had in fact nothing to do elsewhere. When the clock struck three, Elizabeth felt that she must go, and very unwillingly said so. Miss Bingley offered her the carriage, and she only, wa she only wanted a little pressing to accept it. When Jane testified such a concern in parting with her, that Miss Bingley was obliged to convert the offer of the chase into an invitation to remain at Netherfield for the present, Elizabeth most thankfully consented, and a servant was dispatched from Longburn to acquaint the family with her stay, and to bring her back a supply of clothes. We will go on ahead and call it there for the evening, as now Jane has taken ill and is in the presence of Mr. Bingley's house, and Elizabeth has joined her there, so we shall see what adventures await now at Longburn next time. Have a lovely evening. Keep yourselves safe and well. And remember, never give up, never surrender.